Home Abstract and Title Company was founded in 1867 and is the oldest company still operating in McLennan County. Home Abstract is comprised of a team of honest, friendly, hardworking professionals dedicated to providing both commercial and residential real estate clients with the highest level of communication and service. Their team is committed to working hard and building and maintaining strong relationships because transactions are so much more than just deals. They are clients deserving of the courtesy, care, and respect that Home Abstract and Title Company is known for. Visit Home Abstract and Title Company at homeabstract.com. Cross the Brazos and Waco. Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn. Cross the Brazos and Waco. I'm safe when I reach San Antonio. All right, welcome back to Waco History. This is part of our Crossroads series. Uh, we're, uh, Rick and I are going to do a, a, a segment on Waco as a crossroads of sports. And uh, as we started going into it, I mean, it's amazing what you can talk about. And we had to find a local sports legend to bring in to help us with that. We, we, we actually interviewed quite a few to try <laughs> to find the f- right one. You yeah. couldn't find one, so I am here, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, see, that voice you just heard needs no introduction. That's uh, John Morris, who now – so he's always been announced as the voice of the Bears, I mean, in recent years, taking that from Frank Fallon. But lately I've heard him introduced as just the voice. They just say oh, the voice. Oh, yeah, the voice okay. of the Bears. Just call me. Yeah. When I don't care what you call me, just call me. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Hey, and <clears throat> Stephen, this isn't scripted, but I would love to take a second and hear a little bit of the history of how John got into that job. Oh, oh that's sure. Good, yeah, please. Well, uh, thanks for that because it gives me an opportunity to talk about Frank Fallon, which mm. I love doing any yes. chance I get. Folks who have been around for a while remember Frank and, and revere him, I, I hope, as much as I do because Frank was just such a professional and he was such a good man, too. You know, he grew up, uh, he was born in El Paso. He grew up in San Antonio, came to Waco, started working at KBTX Radio and, and TV and did those things and did Baylor games back when radio was it. You know, there were very few sporting events on mm. television. So the radio audience was just huge. And Frank goes back to the days of Kern Tips and, and so many other just legendary Texas broadcasters. So, so give us some, a year. I mean, about, about what time period? Frank started in 1953. Mm. All right, started doing Baylor games in 1953. Wow. And uh, and then he retired and had to retire early because of Parkinson's in 1995. So I was fortunate enough to work with him for eight years, and it was Mm. the best learning experience anybody could ever have. Mm -hmm. I mean, sitting next to Frank Fallon doing football Mm -hmm. games. And then when he retired, I was fortunate enough to follow him. And I'll always, I'll never make the mistake that I, 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 replaced Frank Fallon. I succeeded him in this job. (laughs) Nobody replaces Frank. Mm -hmm. And to me, he is the voice of the Bears and always will be. Mm -hmm. I'm in this position for some time. Somebody's going to follow me, but Frank will always be the voice of the Baylor Bears. What were some of the highlights for Frank in his career? For him? Yeah. He, uh, you know, he did a little bit of everything. It was funny. Yeah. In those days, I mean, you would say, I'll do that job. Yeah, I can do that job. It's just, if you could get there, you could do it. So he would do high school games on Friday night. He would do Baylor games on Saturdays. And then for a short time, he did the Oilers games on Sundays. So imagine that schedule. And uh, he did it and did everything like the pro that he has been and and always will be remembered as that. Uh, He was the voice of the Final Four, the PA voice of the Final Four for 21 years. That started in 1978. Baylor connection there. Dave Kaywood was a Baylor sports information guy, went to work for the NCAA. They decided instead of using the local announcer at whatever arena they're playing in they wanted to have their own guy and Dave Cabewood said I've got a guy for you (laughs) and he called Frank and said would you be interested and he said absolutely and he said I need an audition tape and Frank said I don't have one and (laughs) Dave said just go sit in the heart of Texas Coliseum and record uh, your introductions and send it to me and that was that was the audition for Frank Fallon wow that's 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 awesome Yeah, I remember the first time I, I heard his voice. It was on TV, and yeah. I could hear his voice in the background yeah, yeah. during a Final Four, and I'm like, that sounds like Frank Fallon. <laughs> it's him. And I, you know, of course, I couldn't, you couldn't Google things then to figure out yeah. thing. I don't remember how I confirmed it, but 
yeah, a really cool part of history there. Best seat in the house. And haven't we been fortunate here to have someone, the, the quality and stature of Frank Fallon doing broadcasting and Dave Campbell writing sports here yeah. at the Waco Tribune mm-hmm. Herald and then at Baylor. Think about that. I mean, put those two up against mm-hmm. anybody in any city in Texas, any city in the country probably. Yeah, that's really remarkable. And uh, talk a little bit about your interaction and your experiences with Dave. Uh, we're thinking a lot about Dave. Dave's passing hasn't been that long, mm-hmm. and what a legacy he left behind. Yeah, so. in December, and uh, gosh, I mean, Texas Football Magazine, but then the Waco Tribune Herald, and when he left there, you know, he had a lot of writing left in him, and Baylor said, come write for us. And so he did the Baylor Bear Insider for a few years Mm -hmm. and was really, I think, writing up until his final days. Mm -hmm. Uh, He would come to press conferences and he had a story written on Baylor's game from Saturday and he'd hand it to Jerry Hill and hand it to the coach. And uh, I don't know where it ended up, where it was printed, but Dave was still writing Mm -hmm. and just such a, you know, such a good man and, and such a, just so well respected, you know, in his industry, you know, the, the written word like Frank was in broadcasting. So as a, as a businessman, I love when a great entrepreneurial idea, you know, wins. So yeah. do, how did he come up with the idea of the Texas football <laughs> magazine? I mean, that, that didn't exist right? until him. I, the way I understand it is that he was looking for information on Southwest conference football and he went looking in the magazine stands and there just wasn't anything there, uh, nationally or regionally. So Dave said, I'm going to start this magazine. (laughs) And, uh, he, and, um, uh, what was his name? His, his kind of his sidekick for many, many years. Uh, was with Dave and, and at, at Dave's kitchen table, they would lay out the magazine. They would do the interviews, they would lay it out and get it printed. And from there it was born and, uh, unbelievable. So, so if I remember right, some of the genius was he just, he told high school coaches, you write up a little blurb on your players and send it to me. Yeah. And so a lot of it was just him aggregating that. <laughs> That's right. Into, and so I, I remember as a, as a high school football player, you know, all my friends couldn't wait till that till the, the fall edition came out. And you'd look it up and read what was written about you. You didn't know your coach wrote that. Right. Yeah, that's true. But it's in Dave Campbell's Texas Dave Campbell, football magazine. Dave Campbell knows who I am. Yeah. Well, personal side to that, my son played football at Midway and turned out to be a pretty good player, especially his last two years. And with his junior year, Dave Campbell football magazine, MJ's name is in there. I teared up. I mean, it was such a big deal. I mean, that was a big deal to have MJ Morris's name in Dave Campbell's Texas football magazine. That is awesome. <laughs> Do you have that one framed on the wall? The I house? should. Yeah. I've got the magazine. It's not framed. Yeah. <laughs> so you said there was overlap. So you started with Baylor football in the 80s? 87, 87. was my first year. Okay. At that time, uh, here's a little broadcasting history. At that time, we had the Southwest Conference Radio Network, yeah. and it was ingenious. It was really, it was run by Host Communications based in Lexington, and it was ingenious because it, it pulled everything together, and then the network would send out games to particular markets. You always, you know, here in Waco, we'd always get the Baylor game, but you'd also get other games of other Southwest Conference schools. And it was really well done. Every, every broadcast went into a studio, and they sent them out to different affiliates. And uh, every school had their own broadcasters, uh, except he, here's what they did. They, they worked like one broadcast. If Baylor played Texas Tech in a game, in a football game, it would be Frank from Baylor. It would be Jack Dale from Texas Tech. And they worked together. If it was a home game in Waco, Frank did play-by-play, Jack did color, vice versa if the game was in Lubbock, which was ingenious. Wow. Yeah. And, and you think about Frank being such a good play-by-play guy, but in this role, he'd have to do color at certain times, and he was so good, he, he was the best color man in the world, you know? <laughs> and Jack Dale was a pro who did 50 years of games for Texas Tech, and he was the same way. So that worked really well for a very short time. Uh, and I worked with Frank starting in 87. That was only the three non-conference games. And then when they got to conference, then it would be this, one from one school, one from the other. And about 88, uh, things blew up uh, yeah. because of Jackie Sherrill in Texas A&M because A&M said, I think we can do better on our own. So we're pulling out of the Southwest Conference radio network. And that basically imploded everything, and then everybody just did their own network. Oh, hold on, hold on. So you're saying <laughs> A&M, A&M, A&M made a unilateral decision 
to do something shocking, right? That would have a negative effect <laughs> on their peer schools. That's like, the way it turned out. Yes, that's really? what I'm saying. And maybe it was foreshadowing. Maybe? It was all Jackie <laughs> Cheryl at that point, but it worked out well for me because that meant I've worked with Frank every game. So mm. yeah, it's kind of a good news, bad news thing. And then other sports, obviously, you're known for basketball, but other sports you got involved with at Baylor? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I started, the first sports I actually did for Baylor was basketball because Frank, again, going back to him and the way I owe him so much is he was so good. He was doing Southwest Conference television game of the week for basketball. And so he would go to, he'd go to A&M and he would be welcome there, you know, uh, as you know, the Southwest Conference guy, even though everybody knew he was the Baylor guy. So he did a, a game every Saturday, Southwest Conference TV game of the week. If he had a conflict, I got to fill in for him on the Baylor game on that Saturday. So the first game I ever did was in 1984, Baylor and Vanderbilt at the HOT Coliseum, and and did hmm. pretty much every Saturday uh, filling in for Frank on Baylor basketball. So that's where I started, and then working with him in football, and then succeeded him when he retired in 1995. And then after that, Frank, I, I got him to stay on for a couple more years doing baseball. And man, we had fun doing baseball together, uh, Baylor baseball games, uh, and that that worked really well for him. And it was kind of a you know kind of an off ramp for him from doing everything to still be doing baseball. And I loved the time we spent together. Mm. I, I actually. Uh ask another broadcaster i won't say who uh this question earlier this week uh but this is just a question before we get into the to the crossroads stuff <laughs> just doing so many sports i mean the pace of those sports is so different i mean as far as as a broadcaster and what you prefer i mean which pace do you like i mean doing a basketball game is so dramatically different from a football game and then having done baseball as well right yeah you know the answer to that is i like them all and i like them because they are different you know in football you can put and a lot of folks say what's your favorite and i say well just ask me which one of my children is my favorite you know it's it's a hard answer but football during football season you know it's the biggest crowd it's one game a week you know there's nothing better than that right football in texas and then we get to basketball and i grew up in kentucky so i've always loved basketball and and especially working with coach drew here i mean what could be better than that yeah. and then you get to baseball and softball in the spring and it's it's laid back and it's tell stories and totally different pace like you said mm -hmm. And that's fun also. So I like them all. I like the different, uh, the different uh, uh, ways that they make you grow and make you be able to uh, be versatile and do different sports. I would hate to do one and wait for it to come around a whole year later, you know. Mm -hmm. So I really like doing the different sports. And then at Baylor, I've had the opportunity to do a lot more like soccer, like volleyball, like acrobatics and tumbling. I mean, what do I know about acrobatics and tumbling, right? Have a good color analyst, and uh, and we make it work. So I, would, I enjoy them all. I would love to hear one of your calls in uh, there's acrobatics. A lot of, yeah, and there's tumbling. a lot of, wow, ooh, there's a lot of that Ouch. there. <laughs> so, so radio, historically, as a, as a medium, um, where would you say it is? And it's in its lifespan. I mm. mean, apparently, you know, things have changed. There's a lot more technologies out there. Is streaming. A lot of what you're doing now is, is on uh, streaming platforms. Um, w when was radio at its apex? Not to say that it's not right now, but... Well, uh, I think we're at the crossroads. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. With radio, certainly it was much more uh popular i, I think is mm -hmm. fair to say when there weren't all the games on tv and now pretty much every game is on tv uh we do a lot of those ourselves on big 12 now on espn plus but i well, think you say tv you mean streaming on devices that would be what we do that's espn yeah, yeah. plus that's yeah, yeah. true yeah it's not whatever it's not over TV. the air tv yeah, yeah. that's true but I think there's always going to be a place for radio. Somebody uh, yesterday, Cheryl Gotchis, I ran into her and she said, oh, I listened to you on Saturday. And I said, well, that's nice. She said, Rich and I were going from one place to another and we had to listen to the radio. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, thanks for tuning in. But, okay. but it's always going to be there. I mean, if, if you're yeah. between TVs or traveling or something, right. radio is always going to be there. Well, because this is a history show, yeah. let me <clears throat> let me paint a scene for you. I came across a photo years ago, uh, downtown Waco, and uh, the scene, I'll kind of try to paint the scene, it was somewhere on Austin Avenue, and uh, there were some there were some people up on the awning, 
above everyone else, and there was a I've seen that picture. I know what you're talking board. about. Yeah, and and there's a you know some score. It looks like chalkboard or something yeah. for scores, and there's a bunch of people out out in the street, and everybody's paying attention. And um, for I was trying to figure out what was going on. Yeah, right. And and I I think they had the names of the teams or something, and I looked it up. It was a World Series game. Yeah, in the early 1920s, the early time of radio. And that's what they were doing. They were listening on the radio and they were reporting the score to everyone out, you know, and, and who was on base and where the players were. Um, oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. 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 Anyway. That's, that's really cool. cool. That's a great picture, by the way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And once you understand what's going on, it's right. even cooler. <laughs> right. And we'll put that picture in the show notes uh, just, just so you'll have that picture Ooh, for nice. reference. You can take a look at it. Well, let's back up. So uh, Rick reminded me we, we, uh, we need to do some history here. So... I mean, if we, we've kind of introduced, I think, some of the major sports that we can talk about and in amateur and professional sports uh, going back to the 19th century. We were talking earlier, it's probably baseball that maybe gets well, organized if, first. If you were, if you were going to talk about early sporting contests, mm-hmm. you know, what would it, and I haven't found anything specific about Waco, but I know what was going on was horse racing, mm. right? I mean, you get a couple guys together with a horse or a motorcycle or any type of device that can go fast, and they're going to start racing yeah. at some point. So. Yeah, and actually Oakwood Cemetery, which, of course, is a beautiful landscape, that was a racetrack. That was a horse racetrack uh, before mm. it was a cemetery. Ooh, yeah. fascinating. Yeah, the original cemetery, First Street, down by Fort Fisher in that area, but the new and improved cemetery, cemetery that came in in the 1880s uh, where Oakwood was, they they took over a racetrack that was out there. Mm. Yeah, it's a way to kill a weight racetrack. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <coughs> Sorry, but yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, in, in looking at the history, it looks like post Civil War things started um, things started to progress in the in the the national game. The first professional nationally game, professional nationally, was uh, baseball. Mm-hmm. And it looks like the first team was uh, down in Houston in the 1870s, and uh, the first professional one. There were amateur ones going on already. In fact, a, a guy here in Waco, uh, Tom Paget, of the Paget Company, mm-hmm. <clears throat> organized the first amateur teams, and eventually uh, organized the first professional team here in Waco. And uh, these teams would travel, you know, around the, the circuit of of uh, Texas and play each other. Uh, until eventually they formed the Texas League in uh, 1889. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you've got a, you've got kind of two because of we're in the South and this is the time of Jim Crow. You kind of have two competing stories there. You've got mm, that's right, black ball, black baseball organizing in in the 1880s, 1870s, and you have white b- baseball organizing as well. There are uh, there's several kind of unnamed. Uh, African American teams, but we don't really see uh, anything really organized uh, in black baseball uh, until we get to uh, a Waco team joining the Texas Colored Baseball League uh, in 1882. Uh, and from 1897 to 1898, the Waco Yellow Jackets uh, were the black baseball team that was active in Waco. And one thing most people don't know that is very interesting is. We had a famous, probably the most famous um, African-American player that ever played in Waco, and he oh, played yeah. for his first semi-pro team in Waco as Rube Foster. Hmm. And Rube Foster is the father of the Negro League. So later on, he goes to Chicago, and in the 1920s, he organizes what we know of as the Negro League. But the first time he was ever paid uh, to – he's from Calvert. The first time he was ever paid to play baseball was in Waco. Wow. Left-hand pitcher? Yeah, he uh, Rube Foster, uh, he pitched against a uh, Cincinnati Red named Rube. The pitcher's name was Rube, and he beat him. And so then he assumed that nickname. It became so famous that he beat this white baseball pitcher that he started b- being called Rube. Uh, and mm. so that uh, that's where his name came from. And uh, if I remember right, he's he's buried in the area. Yeah, I can't remember where Rube is buried. It's, it's uh, somewhere in the Waco area, and and he was eventually led into the Hall of Fame. Right, mm-hmm. yeah. he's in the Hall of Fame. Another uh, of my favorite uh, players is Crash Holloway, who was born the day after the crash at Crush. 
I mean, if you want a baseball yeah. name. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if y'all remember that story. Crash at Crush is where mm-hmm. they ram these two trains together outside oh, West yeah. as a publicity stunt mm-hmm. that kills some observers. Well, the next day, uh, this child is born, and he's named Crash. That's so awesome. And uh, he goes on to be a speedster uh, in, in the Negro mm-hmm. Leagues and uh, eventually uh, makes a name for himself. Great. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that baseball story you talked about, uh, white baseball kind of organizing, and what were those teams you were yeah, mentioning Yeah, so, uh, you know, I talked about the one Tom Paget organized. I couldn't find a date on his, but uh, they were the Waco Red Stockings, mm. which, you know, we think about teams today that apparently the, the color of your socks got the, a lot of teams. <laughs> they names. weren't as creative in naming teams. No. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't, uh, they, they didn't, <clears throat> they couldn't Google names and come up with good ones, so... <laughs> Uh, but after that, here's some other names. The Waco Babies, huh. uh, Waco Tigers, Waco Navigators. I think that was a reference to uh, to the uh, Brazos. The Waco Indians, the Waco Cubs, and the last professional team we had were the Waco Pirates, which were actually um, a club team for the real Pirates, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And and they their home was Katy Park. And, of course, Katy Park – enters local sports lore is a really a fascinating place. I mean, uh, Joe Lewis boxes an exhibition match there. Oh, um, that's a great cross. Yeah. Right I mean, there. th- there's, <laughs> there's all sorts of folks that make, uh, appearances. Uh, Jesse Owens makes an appearance at, at Katie park and, and actually, uh, Paul Quinn will play games at Katie park. And so it's really an interesting space, but, uh, it's dedicated in 1904. Teddy Roosevelt actually comes through town. Uh, and, and dedicates Katy Park. That's what it's open for. Uh, but it's a for a half century. It is the place uh, to go see baseball uh, in Waco. Yeah. So what what happened? Uh, what what was the demise of Katy Park? I know you've had another uh, episode on that, but yeah, just to uh, recap it. A couple things to to remind yourself: the first night uh, baseball uh, game that's played in Texas is played at Katy Park. The Kansas City Monarchs, which are a very famous Negro League team comes through bringing their portable light set, put it up, have great attendance. Uh, the local owners uh, of, of the Dons, I think at that, no, it wasn't the Dons at that time. I think it may be the Cubs at that time. This is in 1930. Yeah, that's Cubs. That's the Waco Cubs. Uh, the uh, Cubs owners realize that could be profitable, uh, and so they buy a light set and put it up within the next month, and uh, from then on they're having night and course everyone else catches on that it's a profitable idea and they're having night games in texas and so that's one of the interesting things that happened at katie park the uh tornado of course destroys katie park they Mm -hmm. rebuild it uh but rick you mentioned ultimately uh in the late 50s one of the reasons why there's demise of katie park tv yeah 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 as broadcast tv came on and uh they could watch the, the national games and the big league games, people would rather sit at home and do that than pay for a ticket. Yeah, so the, the, the height uh, of uh, the, um, the Pirates, um, a very popular team in the early 1950s, their demise is going to come quickly in Waco uh, after the tornado. Mm-hmm. Yes, so that's baseball. But speaking of professional teams in Waco, can you guys name any other of any other sports, any other professional teams that we've had through the years. Oh, it's quiz time. I like <laughs> this. <laughs> Are there prizes? <laughs> yeah, do, do the Waco Wizards That's count? the first one I There's thought one. of. <laughs> There's one? Yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, Short-lived HOT Coliseum, the yeah. Waco Wizards. Yeah. Some reason hockey didn't catch on. Yeah, yeah. shocking, no, right? No, but wasn't there also an indoor football? There team? was. There was. The Wranglers, maybe? I think that's right. This is an arena. Was it an arena league? I mean. It was sort of an offshoot of the arena football okay. league. Maybe not in the arena football league, but it was indoors. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Interesting. And, and then I think there was a semi-pro basketball team that came in in the 80s or 90s, somewhere in there. Trying to remember. Is there a TSTC connection to that? Mm, couldn't tell you. Yeah. The Marshals. The Marshals, absolutely. Oh, the Marshals. We have Assist. a winner. So, so Mike. Mike Hamilton from, <laughs> from the, Mike gets the prize. From the booth uh, <laughs> comes up with the Marshals. Yeah. 
So yeah. those are the only ones I, I could think of that, or that I knew of that were other professional teams. So suffice mm-hmm. to say, professional sports here in Central Texas kind of came and went. <laughs> yes. Uh, pretty quickly, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, they've had a tough time getting traction. Right, yes. right. Yes. 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 Okay, well, let's, let's go back to the 1800s and talk about um, uh, another uh, um, college sport in football. So um, I'm sure John knows all this history, but I'll give a little bit of it. So I, <laughs> I believe uh, Texas, University of Texas, had the first college team in uh, the 1880s. And uh, soon after, there, there were, by the, by the end of the 1800s, there were five college teams in Texas. So uh, A&M, and I think they, that's somewhere in that time period where they started their Thanksgiving rivalry of uh, UT and A&M. Um, another, uh, another early university in Texas, Austin College, uh, had a football team. And then, uh, uh, then was a, that in Sherman? Yeah. Where it is yeah, now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Do you know their mascot? The kangaroos. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Um, so you, you had, uh, A&M, Texas, Austin college, and then, uh, Adran became the next, uh, college team. And that was actually here in Waco and Adran became TCU. Right. Campus burned down in Waco. They had to do something, so they said, we're moving to Fort Worth. <laughs> yeah, I think in 1910, they, they picked up and, and moved to Fort Worth, got a good, a good offer. Some, someone in, uh, in, in Fort Worth realized, hey, we need a, a university here, and they enticed them to come. But uh, So they started in 90, 1896. Um, the uh, students at Baylor were petitioning to have a football team, right? They saw their crosstown rivals had one, so they really wanted one. So finally, uh, Baylor gave way in 1899. They had their first uh, first team, and I think they were really bad. Hmm. <laughs> Beat Toby's Business College now. <laughs> Give Baylor credit for that. Uh, but, and just so everybody knows, Toby's Business College is not a joke. That was a no, real uh, another school here in, <laughs> right. in, in Waco. Um, yeah, I think the first few years they played four games a year, and a couple of them each year were against Toby's Business College. So <laughs> it was a big rivalry early on. Can you imagine <laughs> in those days starting a football program and everything that's involved in that? Yeah. I really can't. I mean, I think about UMHB, and when they started their program, that was tough enough, but this was right, a century right, ago. <laughs> right. It was, yeah, and yeah, in one of the uh, little articles uh, I read or uh, there, there was a quote from one of the students talking about the Baylor football team, and look how good they are. Just think how good they would be if we actually bought them pants and shoes <laughs> <laughs> to play in. And uh, it makes you wonder if you would even, if you know, a modern fan would even recognize that as football. You know what, <laughs> what they were doing to each other in 1899. It's probably so, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it probably looked a lot more like rugby. I mean, mm-hmm, didn't have all the mm-hmm. all the components that the game has now. Um, in fact, uh, there are, uh, you know, the, the early games, at least for Baylor, were played in an uh, undescript field next to uh, the administration building. And so it was, uh, but it quickly gained um, gained momentum. And so the Carroll family, I think he was the chairman of the Board of Regents at the time. Uh, his son was actually the one who, who uh, convinced the, the, the dad, to, hey, let's, let's get behind this thing. And uh, the Carroll family donated a thousand dollars, and that was what built Carroll Field, wow. which yeah. is next to Carroll Carroll Library, um, which is so the, there's Carroll Library and Carroll Science on yeah. campus still. The Carroll family is very generous to Baylor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, the sign, kind of an arched, kind of an arched sign of Carroll Field. I don't know if it's the original, but there's maybe a replica of that that's in the sub today. Yeah, it's really cool oh, to really? see. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, cool. Yeah, and it was a multi-purpose field that would they would set up for football, and then it would become the baseball stadium or baseball field during the, the spring. Yeah, and I've seen old pictures, you know, of sports out on the quad, uh, you know, playing tennis out on the quad and mm. things like that in those early days of Baylor. Uh, so a lot of sports in that area. Yeah, so where would they have gone to next after Carroll Field? Because they outgrew it. Yeah, Carroll Field would have been the switch, I think, over to the Cotton Palace uh, Park where they were having games over there. And we we had T.J. Webb on who he wrote a book on the 1926 A&M Baylor riot mm. that occurred. So that that is the infamous game where there's a riot at halftime 
and an A&M student is killed uh, at halftime and almost uh, as, as he covers uh, created all sorts of reaction in College Station and in Waco over that, as you might imagine. Mm. That rivalry uh, went back. Of course, it's ended now, sadly, but that rivalry went back to the turn of the century as well. Yeah. So it's a very old rivalry. Yeah. Well, when, when there are only five teams to play, uh, everybody was your rival. <laughs> <I think. Yeah. laughs> That's right. Um, so from there to uh, Municipal Stadium, right? Yeah. After yeah. Cotton Palace. And so where where would and we we talk about those places that's everybody everybody knows where they are. <laughs> True. So, um, yeah. So Cotton Palace would be if you know where uh, Cesar Chavez Middle School is now. Mm-hmm. So that would have been that area of kind of the the, the Cotton Palace uh, is where that would have been. So um, you can think between. Kind of Dutton and Webster. Is it Dutton and Webster? Dutton and Clay? Dutton and Clay. Yeah, not too far from where we're sitting. No, right very now. close mm. to where we're sitting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then uh, and then the municipal stadium. What, what's the story there? Wasn't it in the kind of the same area? Was it? I think it was the same area. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, I think was it that was just rechristened the municipal stadium or they built a new structure? That I don't know. In that area? I can I can picture Muni Stadium. So. Yeah. So the Cotton Palace uh, is. Kind of the the Great Depression kills the Cotton Palace, and so it goes well, it, away. It, it burns think, down at least once, I think. Well, that <laughs> we're going to talk about that on another episode okay, because that's right. an inter- interesting story. But yeah, Cotton Palace goes away in the 1930s, and I think it is repurposed as Muni Stadium. Uh, it is what you're thinking gotcha. about. Gotcha. Muni okay. Stadium. Yeah. Then they really went uptown, and uh, Baylor Stadium was built and not, opened in 1950. And uh, 1950, it changed its name mid-80s, 85, I think, halftime of a game between Baylor and Arkansas. It became Floyd Casey oh, Stadium. wow. And uh, no, it wasn't 85 because Frank and I were doing the game together. And we laughed because we had to immediately change all of our uh. Baylor Stadium references <laughs> to Floyd Casey Stadium. So there was someone in marketing and advancement <laughs> who had cut a deal, I'm guessing. In, uh, it's a very generous donation yes. by the Casey family. Yes. Um, so being a construction guy, I seem to remember somewhere reading that, uh, the total construction cost for the original stadium, they've added onto it throughout the years, but the original construction cost was like 200 or $250,000. Amazing. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, that wouldn't, that, that doesn't buy an air conditioner at the new pavilion. Right. I mean, that's, that's, uh, crazy. The cost of inflation. That's amazing. So 1950 to 2013, Floyd Casey slash Baylor Stadium, the home of Baylor football, and then McLean Stadium opened, thanks uh, in large part to Robert Griffin III winning the Heisman. I mean, that was the big boost that helped the fundraising that really built McLean Stadium. Yeah, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is, of course, we're getting in the John Morris era here, and you talk about particularly for football – so, I mean, within a 10-year period, within a five-year period, how much change happens in the program? I mean, as far as national visibility and, and uh, you know, demand for games, demand for access, you know, all those things change quickly for Baylor. Yeah, and, and I love Coach Taff, and I think Grant Taff is, uh, you know, kind of a central figure whenever you talk about Waco sports and crossroads. Right. Yeah. And him coming here in 1972 changed the Baylor program. He, he didn't have the, uh, oh, woe is me, you know, approach uh, that a lot of Baylor folks had. And he's, he wanted to make Baylor a winner. In 1974, they won the Southwest Conference when nobody thought they could. And then when the Big 12 started, nobody thought Baylor would ever win a Big 12 Conference championship. And they've won three now. So 1913, I mean, I'm sorry, 2013 and 2014. And last year, 2021. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, Grant Taff, he brought a lot of uh, leadership and, and – uh, focus on Waco, and eventually, even as as he uh, uh, when he left the coaching profession, he became um, an executive in the National Coaches Association, right. right? And that eventually led to them moving. That's it. Here. Yeah, yeah. moving um, here. American Football Coaches Association, and that was one of the stipulations for him taking the job. It was in Orlando. The offices were in Orlando, and he said, "I'll take the job, but the offices are going to be in Waco." They said, Coach, you're the executive director. You do what you want. <laughs> yeah. One of his greatest recruiting jobs was getting those folks to move yeah. here that's, with him from Orlando to Waco. Yeah. That's well, great. well the, right there on that, right there in that area is the reminder of Texas's crossroads, Texas Sports Hall of Fame. And I know you've done a lot of things with the Texas Sports of Hall of Fame over the years, but 
I mean, I think that's here. Uh, I don't know if you know more of that story of, of, of how that ended up in Waco. Uh, credit to Charlie McCleary. You guys remember Charlie mm-hmm. McCleary? Mm-hmm. He was here, and, man, he was the driving force behind that. It was up in Grand Prairie, and it was nice, but it was kind of lost in the Bantriplex. And Charlie wanted to move the Texas Sports Hall of Fame and the Texas Tennis Hall of Fame to Waco and had the backing, found the backing and the support. But, man, he was a bulldog in getting that done. And it was so cool to watch when it finally opened. I can remember the opening of the Texas Sports Hall of Fame. And Charlie McCleary was just beaming like a, you know, a proud papa when that finally happened. Yeah. I think it's a destination now. It so is. I, I mean, it is. So it's I think great. It's been a great move uh, for Waco and for the uh, Hall of Fame. So, hey, let's uh, let's jump back into some history. Okay, and keep it in football. Um, a, a an icon in Waco. Most people drive by it on. Uh, I guess it's on Lake Air, Paul Tyson Field. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I bet many people don't know the story of Paul Tyson. Really, really interesting guy in a in a, a huge uh, part of the history in Waco. So he's, he's born in 1884, um, ends up coming to Waco to, uh, to go to school, went, went to Adran, I think played some football there, and um, you know, I think went to medical school for a little bit, but then ended, ended up getting into the teaching profession and coaching, and uh, ends up in Waco coaching right before World War I, uh, teaching and coaching, goes off to the war, comes back, um, and then picks up coaching again. And so by 1921... Um, he he put he fields a team that just beats everybody, mm. and uh, may have been one of his best teams ever. But unfortunately, he was the uh, Waco ISD or it wasn't an ISD at the time, but but uh, uh, was was not part of UI the UIL. Mm. The UIL had just started, mm. um, which a little little side note on that it's it's actually a part of UT. It's a sub department in UT, and they they did it to help organize sports in Texas. So. UIL was a new organization. They end up joining it. And um, and then he just rips off one of the best decades of high school football. So um, if, if you really you really go look at all the stats, but in 1922, they end up winning the state championship. And keep in mind, at that time, there was only one state champion. Mm, yeah. right? right. There yeah, wasn't. That's right. right. There wasn't six A's, six different A's of categories and Division ones and twos, right. right. I mean, there was one champion. So in 1922, Waco uh, beat Abilene 13-10. to 10. In 1923, they went to the championship again. They lost to Abilene 3-0. Um, in 1924, they went back to the, uh, to the state game, lost to Dallas Oak Cliff 31-0. Wow. Uh, but in 25, with a little vengeance in their heart, they came back uh, and won, beating Dallas Forest Avenue 20-7. to 1926, they beat Oak Cliff 20-7. to In 27, they beat uh, Abilene 21-14. to um, um, And then it's a few more years. He gets back to the championship game uh, in 39 and loses to Lubbock 20-14. to um, uh, but just, uh, in, in his heyday, um, you know, one of the things that, that, uh, they, they talked about, he, he developed some new plays, some new things. And he had a thing they called the spinner play. I would love to see this thing in action, but just the way it was described was the quarterback, you know, takes the ball and spins around. And as he's spinning, he's got multiple backs to hand it off to. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and the defenses never knew which one he was handing it off to. Ingenious. Right? Yes. <laughs> I've seen kickoff returns like that. I don't know that I've ever seen a quarterback do it. Yeah. And uh, so this innovative offense. And uh, he actually uh, spends a, spends time with a couple of, uh, of, of guys who are huge in the football uh, lore and that's uh, Newt Rockney and Pop Warner. Wow, mm. pretty yeah. good company there. For yeah, Paul Tyson. Right, and uh, <clears throat> to to the tone of the, those guys considered him their mentor. Mm. Wow. wow. So think about that. Isn't it kind of a shame that Paul Tyson Field is is now gone away? Yeah. I mean, WISD Stadium certainly replaced it a few years ago. But don't we need something here in this area named after Paul Tyson? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you think so? Well. Um, his uh, his demise in uh, Waco football was not as glorious. So uh, he ends up um, having a mediocre eight and two season, 
<laughs> yeah, Can't fan, run out of town. Fans are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In, uh, um, yeah, eight and two season in 1939, and uh, they let him go. Wow. Yeah. The, there was a little bit of a cloud around that. He he was a lifelong bachelor, and uh, you know, and so there were there were some rumors that uh, uh, there was some inappropriate contact with students or with players. But the amazing thing was the the uh, the, the parents and the players unanimously went to the school board and said, no, this, this guy's great. I mean, there's nothing here. Um, but somebody had an axe to grind, and they, wow. got, they got rid of him. Mm-hmm. Um, he, uh, he left there, coached a couple other places, did some, some, uh, some uh, college jobs, and un- unfortunately never really got back to that same level. And uh, in 1950, as he's getting ready, he was at Daniel Baker College, um, and he died of a brain hemorrhage. Mm. So kind of tragic in that sense, right? right? Had this incredible run in the twenties and was, was known as a, you know, one of the masterminds of the game, uh, you, you know, to the, to these, um, guys like Rockney and, and Warner, um, what a storied history. And we mentioned the Texas Sports Hall of Fame. Part of that is the Texas Tennis Hall of Fame, but also the Texas High School Football Hall of Fame yeah, is absolutely. in that same building. So there's a lot in there about about Paul Tyson and his great career. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's talk basketball, right? We've we've talked uh, we've talked baseball, we've talked football. Let's talk basketball. Uh, one of the things I love, and John, you've done these segments on your uh, radio broadcast, is interviews you've you've done with the members of the forty eight team. Oh yeah, you know that. Uh, I think any time, particularly in the Drew era, as we've had success in basketball, they've referenced back those glory years of the late nineteen forties. And what are some uh, memories maybe they've shared or things that stood out to you? First off, I tell most listeners that they hadn't heard about those teams. Uh, well, I don't remember that firsthand. Let me make that remark. <laughs> but have visited with guys like Jack Robinson. Dr. Jack Robinson is is the one that I had the most contact with, was on that team. And it was coached by Mr. Bill Henderson. And they won the uh, Southwest Conference in 1948, won it again in 1950, went to the Final Four both of those years. And it was a much shorter path to the Final Four. It was sort of like, I think it was 16-team tournament at that time. Mm. So you win two games and you're going to the Final Four. (laughs) But great accomplishment nonetheless. Baylor went there, 1948, lost to Kentucky uh, in the championship game, coached by Adolph Rupp. And uh, no shame there. Uh, I want to say that might have been Kentucky's first national championship was the win over Baylor in 1948. Not positive about that. Got back in 1950, lost in the semifinals, didn't play in the championship game. But uh, but guys like like Jackie Robinson, and this is Dr. Jack Robinson, the Baylor Mm -hmm. All-American, was a key member of that team in 48 and then played in the Olympics representing uh, Baylor in the United States in the 1948 Olympic Games in London. So he was wow. one of the top players in the world, basically, and right. come, came from Baylor, retired, or after after Baylor became a minister, a Baptist minister, retired in uh, Augusta, Georgia, and lived there till he passed away just a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. But amazing to think that history, Banner's in the Farrell Center right now, you know, say 1948 Final Four, 1950 Final Four, and and there's the 2021 national championship banner also, <laughs> <laughs> but a great history going back. Mm-hmm. The the other person I know you've you've talked to is this earlier conversation we had about segregation in sports uh, in the 19th century. Of course, unfortunately, that's a 20th century story as well uh, for way too long. And Tommy Bowman, I know, is someone else that that you've interviewed before. Yeah, talk a little bit about Tommy. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, I love Tommy Bowman, and his story is remarkable how he got to Baylor, and he was the first African-American student athlete uh, at Baylor. And his teammates really, you know, really surrounded him when he needed that support of his teammates. But he's got some awful stories to tell about Mm. travel, you know, during that time and him being the only black player with the Baylor team. But boy, he had the best attitude and he stuck it out. And uh, I think I think there should be a statue of Tommy Bowman up somewhere Mm. because uh, what years that would have been early 60s. Because uh, John Hill Westbrook was the first um, 
uh, African American student athlete in the Big, tw- I'm sorry, in the Southwest Conference, and that was 1966 when okay. he made his debut. Mm-hmm. So Tommy would have been after that, I guess, mm-hmm. right? Maybe right after that, 67, 68, 69. I think right in there was where that was. Mm-hmm. Tommy still lives here in Waco. He's got, oh, yeah, he. Uh, we had him for a lunch with a legend and got him to tell those stories that you're yeah. asking about, and it was remarkable. Right. That's another podcast episode. Yeah. That's Tommy great. Bowman. Mark Tommy on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what are some other things that kind of stand out to you on the basketball side as far as if we wanted to talk about uh, Baylor is, or Waco is kind of a crossroads with regard to Baylor that stand out to you? They, um, I don't know if this was their original home, but they played games at Mars McLean Gym on the Baylor campus, which you think about mm. that building now, yeah. and obviously it looked different then. It was like the, the gym floor was down here and then the a big wall on both sides and the seats were up high. Right. <laughs> That's what they had for a home arena there at Mars McLean. Yeah, I played pickup ball in there for years and I could never imagine that being exactly. big enough <laughs> right. to, to house a student body. It wasn't. Body. No, yeah. it wasn't. But that was the home. And then I guess from there to the HOT Coliseum. I think Is that so. Right? Home of the Waco Wizards. That's uh, right. <laughs> back to the Wizards. Yeah, well, uh, you broadcast some games from the heart of Texas Coliseum. Oh, yeah. 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 And uh, a lot of history there. I mean, it was uh, as a, you know, as a uh, rodeo arena, it's great. As a basketball <laughs> home, it's not ideal, but they made it work. Put that tartan floor right down in the center, brought some stands out to try to make it feel a little more, you know, close. And then everybody else sat up in the stands. It was the night the lights went out at the HOT Coliseum. Baylor was playing Texas A&M. A band member got there late and backed into the uh, uh, power pole outside. The lights went out in the HOT. And it was Baylor and A&M. And Shelby Metcalf said, uh, well, how can you tell? You know, because our HOT was not well known for its lighting inside at that time. Um, and then they closed it down and moved to, uh, to the Farrell Center, the current home. Uh, and 88, 89 season was when Baylor moved there mm-hmm. and now about to build a new one. Yeah. The Farrell center is now Baylor's right now. Baylor's oldest athletic facility. Isn't yep. that wild? It, it it's, opened it, when, uh, it's so historic. Rick Tullis was an undergraduate I student. Was a, <laughs> I was a freshman when it opened at Baylor. You were there. That's right. Yeah. And I, and I watched, uh, uh, some games at, um, at HOT. H-O-T. So, and, um, you remember, sorry to interrupt. Do you remember the first event ever held in the Farrell center? Maybe you were there. Ronald Reagan. Yeah, yeah, Ronald Reagan. Exactly. I was there. Yeah. Um, HOT did not have air conditioning either. That's right. Yeah. I (laughs) saw (laughs) Baylor beat Bubba Jennings in TCU uh, at the HOT. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So back to the little construction uh, trivia. The uh, Don't get him started. Yeah, there you go. Feral Center, I think the total cost of the Feral Center was 10 or 11 million dollars. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. What's the price tag on the Foster Pavilion? Pavilion? It keeps going up. Yeah, right? it does. <laughs> I've heard that story. We haven't checked today. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be north of 150? Yeah. I oh, I, oh I, no. I, no, it's like 200. Yeah, yeah. 200. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And it will have air conditioning. Thanks just the Lord not, for that. Not from Capstone Mechanical, but uh, we're not going <laughs> to talk about that here. Um, you have to pay for sponsorship. <laughs> That's true. You don't get that for free. Yeah. Yeah. Um, HOT, some memorable okay. games there, you know. I mean, it was it was not the best, but Baylor beat TCU one time. It was the night that uh, Vinny Johnson and Pat Nunley combined to score 62 points. It was a great game. <laughs> Pat Nunley had two. No, he had 12. And, and Vinny had, Vinny had 50. <laughs> <laughs> the Baylor record, but uh, we love telling that story. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you you actually blew past an interesting crossroads a second ago, uh, Olympians. Oh, that yeah. Have come through Waco. Oh, that's a very good point. Yeah. Mostly track and field, not completely, but mostly track and field. Which is a, which is a great story in itself, why you would have so many track and field um, competitors out of Waco. Thanks to Clyde Hart, you know, quarter miler you, and guys like Michael Johnson came here and Michael started that uh, started that train and five time Olympic gold medalist Michael Johnson and Coach Hart found him and brought him here out of Dallas mm. and then Jeremy Warner and and Daryl Williamson followed him gold medalist there uh, Reggie Weatherspoon won a gold medal also so those are the track and field guys of recent vintage there were I'm sure others uh, further back but. Coach Hart just had the yeah. best of the best, you know, and, and what was and called. Did, and he privately trained people, too. I mean, not just Baylor right. athletes. So there were others here in Waco training that 
at, at the old uh, track and field stadium yep. by, yep. by uh, Floyd, Floyd Casey. Casey. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, like Sonia Richards, who ran yeah. at UT, but then Coach Hart was her coach past UT to Olympic gold medals also. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, well, it's historic just because you called a national championship win. So That is historic. Yeah, we, we, we've, got, we've got to get that on the record. I mean, uh, you know, there's so much you could say. During COVID, no less. Yeah. For, <laughs> I mean, there's so much you could say about that season, but just maybe some initial reflections on just kind of the historic nature of it. Well, consider where the program was when Coach Drew came here. You know, it was down and out. It was an embarrassment because of what had happened under a previous mm-hmm. coach. And it was really in such bad shape that I'm sure there were a lot of coaches that wouldn't have taken this job. But Coach Drew, young guy, had coached as a head coach one year at, at Valparaiso where he followed his dad. Just one year as a head coach, he said, I'll take that challenge. I see, I see what it can become. And in his opening press conference for Coach Drew would have been 2003. Mm-hmm. Um, he said, I'm coming here to win championships. And that, that quote in that press conference, you know, fresh-faced Coach Drew, you know, made the rounds <laughs> when he was winning a national championship in 2021. So just amazing, the vision he had and the hard work that he put in and the staff that was with him together for so long. They've now, some of them have gone on to become head coaches themselves. But, man, he is such a tireless worker and tireless recruiter and such a perfect fit for Mm -hmm. Baylor also, you Mm -hmm. know, with his mission and, and, you know, the championship season, the culture of joy, you know, that uh, he talked about, which is Jesus first, others second, and yourself third. Wrote a book about it. I yeah. recommend it highly. Um, but around that, and he had such a platform to talk about that as Baylor made that championship run. Right. Amazing, right? That's one of three, uh, one of yeah, three national, four national championship banners in the Farrell Center because Kim Mulkey, when she came in yeah. in two thousand, she really transformed the program as well and won three national championships. Went to four uh, Final Fours. Yeah, it's really remarkable. Uh, I mean, where where those programs had been historically, I mean, with the few exceptions that we've talked about earlier, uh, and where they are now. It's, it's just remarkable. Yeah, you, uh, you, you mentioned some of the uh, people that have gone, the players that have gone on to be mm-hmm. coaches, but I think, of, again, as a crossroads segment here, uh, a lot of the coaches that have come through that have, have, have worked under some of these head coaches that we've mentioned and gone on to be incredible head coaches themselves. You got any of them stick out in your mind? Uh, good question. Going back or under Coach Drew or Coach Mulkey or yeah. just yeah. any of them? Yeah, just pick it. I mean, of recent venture um, under Coach Drew, of course, Matt Driscoll was here, and he's now the head coach at North Florida, and Paul Mills is at um, Oral Roberts. And uh, Jerome Tang just left. He'd been here for 18 years and just yeah. left to become the head coach at Kansas State. So. Really cool. That story is really cool. He had other opportunities and just never felt like it was the right place for him or the right time until this past year. Yeah. Then we've got got a bunch of football coaches that are seated throughout the country now. Very much so. In other programs. Yeah, yeah, very much so. So, um, you know, success, uh, when you have a successful program or a successful run, other schools come looking saying, you know, what's your, you know, what's your secret? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's the assistants and those assistants get hired away. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, Rick, I know you've been doing research. Anything else you need to make sure we get in on our crossroads sports? Well, I, I would point back to maybe some of the amateur crossroads mm-hmm. that, that have happened here in Waco over the years. And um, oh, probably about uh, six or seven, eight years ago, uh, as I, uh, I was helping with a, a group of folks start something that ended up becoming Tri Waco and mm. a triathlon downtown. So, so John, you, know, you just need to know this. Rick approached me uh, about two years ago and said we need to do a podcast episode <laughs> on the history of triathlons in Waco. <laughs> and I said, Rick, I can't sell that. But now he's getting now he's getting his opportunity to talk about it. Here, well, here we go. And it was longer than seven or eight years ago, too. Well, well this and, is him. He'll back it up. Okay. Well, and and you're right. And you're right. Uh, I just want to say I was pitching. Uh, um, this before the air conditioning podcast, but he, he chose the air conditioning podcast first. So we'll see who's the better judge of talent. And um, no, no, you're right. It was before that, uh, that, that uh, Tri Waco started. It was 12, 13 years ago. And there is a cool history there. 
What, what Waco, is that history? Waco had the first. No, he's, he's actually right about this. <laughs> yeah, <I know>. Waco <laughs> had the first triathlon in Texas. That's right. In 1980. The, in, the, in the yeah early 80s. Um, uh, Bowden, what was his first name? Um, yes, Jim Bowden? No, that's Dr. Bowden. Um, Ray Bowden. Yeah, Ray Bowden. Yeah, yeah, Ray yes. Bowden. A uh, uh, guy here locally worked in um, worked in the fitness business and uh, got a group of his friends together, and they put one together. They'd, they'd seen one on TV, seen the uh, one in Hawaii, the Kona. Yeah. And thought, well, why don't we do that here in, in Texas? So they did. They they set up out at Lake Waco and and um, uh, used the that that uh, area, the Spiegelville area, where yeah. you have that that little beach area, and uh, and put it on. There was a there was a significant uh, competitor. Yes, there was. You know that this thing went for about ten years. So from eighty to to the early nineties, had a few weather problems and had to get canceled and kind of petered out at the end. But there was a young athlete by the name of Lance Armstrong, uh, and the and as the legend goes, uh, can't remember if he was fourteen or fifteen the first time he won it. Wow, oh, gosh, um, yeah, from Plano, uh, from Plano, and uh, after the race. Uh, his mom followed him home as he rode his bike all the way back to Plano. Yeah. God. Won the triathlon, and it wasn't as hard as his normal workout. So he rode his bike back to Plano. Oh, my God. That's that's a story that uh, I love to tell. Yeah. And yeah. and nobody's disputed it. So <laughs> we're going to keep telling it. No. So, wow. so then that, uh, <clears throat> because of weather or interest or whatever, that triathlon ended up ending. And uh, in uh, oh, 2008 time frame, uh, a group of guys, uh, including myself and some folks at the chamber, thought, "Hey, why don't we do one here in Waco? Except instead of doing it at the lake, we we were uh, envisioning the activation of downtown Waco. This mm-hmm. was before a lot of stuff that's going on downtown. It yeah, was this happening. predated silos. Oh, right. yes. downtown right. revitalization started here. Yeah. It, and the idea was, how can we get more people downtown? How can we act- activate this body of water?" Um, because at the time nobody did anything in Lake Brazos, which is what it is. Uh, in fact, people were, uh, you know, nobody swam in it. Right. Nobody, at the time, the the dam wasn't uh, before this. The the dam had just been um, re-engineered uh, to actually hold the water level constant. Before then, they'd had lots of problems with uh, it malfunctioning, and you know it was it was a common sight to to drive down there and you. would you'd see nothing but the muddy bottom with a couple cars sticking up. And mm-hmm. it was not very compelling for people to go, Hey, let's go do something in the water. All right. Um, so we, we, we had this vision. Uh, so through, through the team at the chamber and some volunteers and the city of Waco uh, was really excited about getting something going. Uh, we had the, the inaugural try Waco and it actually ended up being becoming much more successful than we expected. Uh, John Morris actually volunteered. He was the uh, the announcer at the end of the race. So I didn't realize that. If you uh, if you actually completed it, you got to you got to hear the smooth tones of John Morris announcing your name as you crossed over. Not a draw, but it was hugely successful, wasn't it? Yeah, Just because of our location here. Well, and as a as a young Chamber of Commerce board member, and uh, and doing that, it, some some light bulbs went off in my head. I'm like, hey if you put on a good event and you look at our location, we're in this crossroads of Texas. I probably didn't use that word, but uh, it fits because that's it does the, fit. the podcast we're doing. Um, people will come. And I started looking around and seeing what other things were like that. And you saw amateur, amateur uh, or youth baseball, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the uh, river bend park um, uh, little league. We had this little league, uh, complex here. People were coming from all over the state for the regional, um, little league stuff. Uh, people traveled to Waco. I, I learned, uh, Waco actually hosts more high school football playoff games than any other location in mm. Texas, except AT&T stadium. Mm. Oh, wow. And that's between, you know, Baylor's assets, uh, Midway and, and WISD. We host more playoff games here, and really all kinds of UIL contests. Uh, we host some UIL uh, state championships here. Anyway, you get the point. I, I the light bulb went off in my head. Man, if we could actually be more strategic about this, then uh, it's a huge economic developer, mm-hmm. and you don't have to. It's not like you have to spend a bunch of money. You just got to get people to come here. And so, in uh, about eight years ago, this is where I was going with the original eight years ago. 
um, a group got together and we formed the uh, Greater Waco Sports Commission, which has the sole purpose of thinking strategically about sports and getting them here. And uh, that's led to some lots of different successes. I mean, it could be everything from a uh, some junior college championships that we've we've gotten here to um, uh, to the Ironman triathlon, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is kind of the it's huge the top of the top in that in that mm-hmm. world. Um, it turns out having a river running through the middle of a vibrant downtown is uh, is a great selling point for those 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 uh, multi sport type competitions. So, what sort of how did the participation grow in Tri Waco? How many participants did y'all have start out yep. with and grow to? Yeah, yeah, started out um, first year about five hundred, and then uh, it it grew kind of pre COVID. COVID kind of put a damper on everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, to nine hundred nine mm-hmm. between nine hundred and thousand big event yeah, yeah. In, in one of the one of the top rated um, in, in the in the Waco circuit it was a couple times been the the championship race um, yeah it's it's got a spot on the calendar for triathletes that it's there I mean this is the one to go to that weekend yeah so it's grown to that yeah and um, now that I mean you think about it from mountain biking in Cameron Park, which is a destination uh, mm-hmm. as well for mountain bikers. And, to, and we've hosted many national championships for mm-hmm. mountain biking in Cameron Park, the, too. The Wild West Waco 100 bike ride. Oh, yeah. So, that, I mean, there, there's a lot on the calendar, I think, that happens every year that plays upon this crossroads. Remember the Spinco 500 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bike ride? That goes back a few years. Wow. Yeah. It was yeah. a 500-mile bike ride started and ended in Waco. Wow. All the way to Comfort, they rode to Comfort, Texas, and back. Wow! No, and I, I missed that one. Brings yeah. back that memories. goes way back. Spinco brings back a few memories. There was an ice rink out there at one point. Yeah, uh-huh. Spinco. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah the um, it, ironically, as, as we started doing research on leveraging sports as an economic uh, driver in your community, the sweet spot for uh, for for sports e- economic stuff is 12-year-old girls, 12-year-old hmm. girls' sports, whatever it is. <laughs> whatever the Cheer, sport. <laughs> uh, softball, <laughs> volleyball, they travel the most people, and they spend the most money wherever they go. Because wow. at the end of the day, interesting. it's about heads and beds, right? How many sure. people can you get into your community to to um, you know stay at a hotel and go to your restaurants? And uh, yeah, we, we all like the big national or state championship stuff, whatever, but... From an economic development standpoint, that's the sweet spot. Uh, I got to also mention with Baylor uh, Bear Downs, you know, oh, the, yeah. the bike race. That's right. that, I competed in that a few did times. Did you compete yeah. in yeah. Bear Downs? That's still alive? It, it, so, no. So, the Barathon <laughs> okay, is, is, right, right. is the new Bear Downs. Gotcha. But, you know, the uh, Bear Downs originally was in Heart of Texas Coliseum, and they would right. do a track. <laughs> right. And, and it, which was had to be horrifying for these amateur cyclists uh, and how dangerous that was. And then they moved it on campus. So Rick participated in it on campus and it was equally as bad because you had hairpin turns yeah. uh, oh, and yeah. people crashing into hay bales. So eventually I, I may have caused a couple of crashes. <laughs> not, not eventually student that. foundation that, that does that event uh, came up with the marathon idea, the toughest yeah. half in Texas. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, John, what other great sports trivia do you have in Waco? <laughs> no other – okay, one more sports trivia back to uh, Tri-Waco, the original Tri-Waco. Waco had the first female triathlete in You're the state of Texas. Right. You're absolutely right. Still lives here, Cindy Neal. Yes. Cindy and Gordon Neal, but Cindy was the first. So isn't yes. that a great yeah. piece yeah, of yeah. trivia there? Yeah. And uh, uh, isn't there some uh, a story there about that ice rink too? Weren't there some – some competitive uh, at spin at the one at Spinco. Yeah, I think there was some kind of competition out there. Yeah, I think so. Don't remember the details there. Um, another thing I thought of while you were talking, pole vaulting. Oh yeah, tell us the story there. Baylor has had some tremendous pole vaulters through the years, and uh, there was one stretch where Baylor had the top three pole vaulters in the Southwest Conference on the team together. Wow. And, uh, you know, without the without it in front of me, Bill Payne was one of those. Uh, Todd. Todd was another one. <laughs> but there were three of those guys yeah, that were yeah. all 18-foot pole vaulters. I mean, they were just great. They were the uh-huh. best in the league. 
and they were all right here at Baylor at the same time. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then we uh, um, uh, had a had an Olympian move to Waco, right? And start Bob training, Richards start training. Yeah, and, Bob Richards, uh, future pole vaulters. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So the strange crossroads you find in Waco, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've covered the gamut, and John, you've been really generous with your time. I want to thank Rick for making the ask uh, to get you on the podcast, but it's been great being with you. Any stories you want to make sure you get in before we shut down today? No, I think we've covered everything that I have to <laughs> offer, but you've gained a new listener. I'm definitely going to listen to your uh, Crossroads okay. series, okay? Right. So Rick, great to be with you guys. Three. Rick gets a quarter <laughs> of downloads, so that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thanks, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Waco History Podcast. Like what you heard? Subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. You can find show notes and info on every episode at wacohistorypodcast.com and more info on Waco's past at wacohistory.org. Our theme music, used with permission, is Cross the Brazos at Waco, performed by the late Billy Walker. For more info on Billy's music, go to billywalker.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. This has been a Rogue Media Network production.